Morning, guys. Uh, I'll go through just a quick little uh, history of who I am. Sergeant Jim Gitzy, I'm in charge of the Forensic Identification Unit up here. What? What's that? Uh, basically, CSI. That's kind of what I do. Uh, there's myself and uh, my partner, Vanessa Philpott. Uh, we cover the entire Yukon. Uh, right now, my partner's in uh, Alberta teaching a fire death investigation course, so it's just me for the whole entire Yukon right now. <laughs> Anyways, so I've been all over, uh, starting in Saskatchewan, a couple years from Regina Detachment, then I went to the Lower Mainland, Coquitlam, and then Fort Nelson, and then since 2002 I've been here uh, in the Forensic Identification Unit and I've uh, been in charge since uh, about five, six years now. Um, married 30, for 30 years now. My wife's a teacher here in town. I plan, we're both from Regina, but I plan on staying here. Two kids. There's a few familiar faces I've, I see in here. So we've obviously uh, interacted at scenes before. You guys are from all over the territory, right? Yeah. That's right. So no doubt we've crossed paths. Um, I will say right now that if, uh, uh, when we get to a scene, um, lots of times uh, we're focused on stuff, so if we don't say hi or whatever when we're there, and I mean we're all there to do a job, we're all there as a team, but lots of times when we come to a scene, we're very focused, we've got a job to do, so we get into kind of a game, game phase, game kind of situation, so if we don't say hi, we're not trying to be rude or elitist or anything like that, it's just because we're kind of in the moment. So what we do is we uh, provide frontline support to the GD guys. Uh, last night, 10.30, I got called out for uh, something, so I got home this morning at 4. So um, if I talk too fast or if I don't make any sense, just somebody come up here and hit me in the head and okay. hit reset. Do you want a coffee? <laughs> I just had one. Yeah, thanks. So. What we do basically is we, we get called out by, uh, as it says, um, frontline policing for, for anything from break and enters all the way up to homicides and everything in between. We are also agents for a transport safety board, so plane crash happens, helicopter goes down, uh, like I went to that helicopter crash up on Nares Mountain with the bear biologists there. Nothing more disconcerting than flying to a helicopter crash in a helicopter, it's kind of like, <laughs> so. Uh, we also act on behalf of the uh, Workmen's Compensation Board, so if there's a fatal accident at a uh, Wild well, Integra Tires, that was my scene where the gentleman uh, got squashed there. Um, I do have some photos in here that are somewhat graphic. This is a small territory, so hopefully if you recognize anybody in there, I've got, I don't have faces, I've just got situations for the most part. Um, but. Yeah, I don't think I have any faces in there. But just in case, uh, like I said, there are graphic, but I mean, you guys do what you do, so you've seen graphics, so I'll just give you a warning anyways in case there's somebody here. Um, and who else? Corners. No, 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 no. I basically, just, uh, there's nothing like that. Shouldn't be anything like that in here. I'm, I can't remember, because like I said, I'm a little tired right now, but. Anyway, so, and we also, we're, we act as agents for the coroner service, so if they don't arrive right away, and sometimes they don't arrive at all, we'll go in, we'll document the scene uh, through, um, well, um, that'll be the next slide, we'll document the scene, and we'll provide, like, last night's uh, little event there, I'll do up three reports, one for myself, one for the general duty constable for his file, and then one goes to the coroner for their file. Uh, we're, my, my partner and myself are highly trained in, uh, in all kinds of death investigation. Um, as I said right now, my partner's down teaching a course in Alberta on fire death investigation, so burnt bodies, uh, essentially. And, um, as I said earlier, there's only two of us for the whole, the whole territory. Um, we both have been tr highly trained to testify in court. Uh, I was testified last week on that prelim for the, uh, the, the young fellow out in the gravel pit there last year. Uh, as you probably have seen from all the papers and stuff and the news, we've been fairly uh, busy for the last uh, couple of years, which, and I've been here, like I said, since 2002, and this is just kind of crazy. So if we're not going to a scene like that, we're going to court, or we're preparing and going to court. So two of us stay fairly busy. Um, 
again, like I said, we go to scenes, we document them, and in some cases, like fingerprints, footprints, tire impressions, etc., we, uh, we, we may give opinion evidence for that. So basically our duties, preserve and protect a scene. So we get there, and this is kind of where we start to cross over. Uh, I use this photo because uh, the supervisor uh, from the ambulance crew had to show up, and um, basically you can see our white truck in the background. There's actually some medical equipment there that was in the scene when I got there. And until I release it, and again, we're not trying to be bad or we're not trying to be uh, um, uh, difficult, but the fact of the matter was this, stu this medical stuff was inside the scene, so until I clear it, it doesn't leave the scene. You know what I'm saying? When I get there, that's how the scene stays. stays. So um, the, that's obviously me at that Porter Creek scene where the guy got shot last year using a metal detector. And uh, so we search the scene for evidence. We measure and draw. Uh, sometimes we get we have laser units that we use. We use the traffic section. We use uh, we have drones now that are uh, uh, highly uh, efficient and really good product to use. And uh, of course our detailed reports. And then as I said earlier, we act as uh, um, agents for those uh, the certain groups there. Um, and just so you're aware of this. Uh, when it comes to handling bodies and stuff, and I, and I, I got a, my, one of my slides here is about you guys protecting life, and I understand that. But just so you understand how um, DNA, as we all know right now, is so, so fine. It, it's such a, it doesn't take much to transfer your DNA onto a body. And that's fine, but that's something that you may have to speak to. Has anybody here? Had to testify in court about anything yet? Have you been called in? So see, there's three people back there that have been called. So just remember that it, you guys as professionals, does anybody here have a CV created? Uh, curriculum vitae? Yeah, you do? Anybody, do you know what that is? Basically it's your resume as a professional, your training and stuff, because you may, going to a scene, something happens, you may end up getting called into court, okay? Again, if I get to a scene and something has changed, I don't testify, I testify to what I see when I get there and what I depict on my photos and my video and stuff like that. If something has been moved or whatever, you may be called in. And I've got a slide later on that, that kind of shows that. If we can do a recreation or something with you guys, and again, there's a slide coming up on that to eliminate that, but just be prepared that you could be called into court, okay? You move something, whatever. So anyways, this has uh, never been as true as this guy, as Dr. Uh, or Professor Lokard says here, and as you've all probably read it, I mean, that's kind of our business, right? We always, you look for the smallest thing and, and nothing is impossible, okay? Okay, uh, wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whatever he leaves, even unconsciously will serve as a silent witness against him, not only his fingerprints or his footprints, but his hair, the fibers from his clothes, the glass he breaks, the tool marks he leaves, the paint he scratches, the blood or semen he deposits or collects, all of these and more bear mute witness against him. This is evidence that does not forget. It is not confused by the excitement of the moment. It is not absent because human witnesses are. It is factual evidence Physical evidence cannot be wrong, it cannot perjure itself, it cannot be wholly absent, only human failure to find it, study and understand it can diminish its value. Everybody understand what that means? Yeah? It's pretty deep, isn't it? And you think of this guy from hundred and some years ago, well, a hundred years ago, roughly. Okay, again, just, there might be some images coming up here that, blood. Okay. Okay. First, first and foremost, uh, no matter what organizer you guys are with, primary goal is uh, when you arrive at a is at a provincial uh, p potential crime scene is is uh, preserve and protect life, uh, the public and your own. Has anybody been to a scene yet where 
it's been a domestic, you're there to help somebody, and next thing you know, somebody else comes out and attacks you, like the husband, the wife, vice versa. Okay? Happens all the time. So I know you're focused on your job, but also be safe. Okay? You, we don't need two victims there, right? So always be safe. Always consider your own safety. I know, like I said, you've got a job to do. You want to get in there and help that person. I fully understand that, but again, it's like us when we go code three or when you guys go code three to a scene, you got to make it there, right? So it's all nice and good to have the lights and sirens blaring and giving her, you know, 100 miles an hour, but you got to get there, okay? Okay. I know, I found some nice pictures. It's, yeah. So again, you know, you get, you get, like I said, when I get to a scene, it's kind of game on, right? So just, you know, you're, uh, you get the call. Okay, you get a, you got a rough idea what it might be. Uh, you know, you, the mechanics of how the victim is injured may be evident when you get the, or when, when the call comes in. I always find when I get a call that it sounds like it's up here, but when I get there, it's about here. And you probably get the same thing. And then, or vice versa, exactly. Sometimes, oh no, he's got a little cut in his finger, and then you get there, and it's like his head's over in the corner or something. Like, okay, that's not a cut. So, so just be aware to, uh, and and I mean, you guys have you guys have been doing it for many, many years. Obviously, there's quite a few faces, like I said, I've seen before. You know how to keep your emotions, uh, you know, under control and all the rest of it. But just, you know, it's one of the things that as you're you're pumped up, you're going to the scene to be aware of what else might be there. So, uh, obviously you can't see the guy's face. Uh, this is just out of town. I don't know if any of you guys were, this is out at, uh, out at um, Mendenhall. Gentleman obviously uh, committed suicide. There's a gun there. Um, you never, I mean, in this case, some of the things were very obvious. But there was a few things, the reason I get called, I get called a suspicious sudden death, lots. It, it might be clearly a suicide of some sort, uh, like last night's event, but there's something that's unexplainable to the, the general duty members. Maybe you, you guys get there and it's like, wow, I've never seen that before. You've got some sort of suspicion, so then you, you kind of kick it up a level. And then we come in and, and because, well, I mean, in a lot of cases, you guys seen so many injuries and you guys get called to hangings all the time too where somebody thinks that their family member can still be revived and I mean it's a done deal and, and you've seen people suspended from has anybody here seen somebody suspended from uh, extension cords cable. cable what happens they stretch out right so it, it looks like they could stand up and they don't kind of thing right so anyways in a situation like this if you get there and you have to move something you see the guns clearly in a a certain location, it may be a question I'm going to be asking you, right? Because that tells a lot where that gun is positioned, right? It tells that it's possible where he had it that he, that he uh, discharged it himself. If you move something, be prepared to um, tell us the story, okay? Uh, footwear, uh, Watson Lake, about 12 years ago I was there. We had to seize all the uh, ambulance people down in Watson Lake's footwear. I don't know if any of you guys were there at that time. And because there was footprints inside the house in blood, and we had to account for them, right? Everything until I can account for it as evidence is a red herring. If, until I can account for shoes or tire impressions, the ambulance pulls up in front and you guys leave. There's footprints all over the place. If it doesn't quite make sense, I've got to photograph it, video it, measure it, and then I've got to account for it, okay? I get some pictures. And lots of times what we'll do is we'll just say, hey, take your boot, throw it on your photocopier, back at the at your station, or take a picture of it and send it to us, and then that way I can go, okay, that footprint there is that, and then of course we can, you know, there's 30 footprints of the same one, but that's you going one in the same direction. Police officers normally wear the Vibram boots, so I can tell those pretty quick. Uh, dog man always wears some really funky tread shoes because that's, they're cool, whatever. I can usually tell his, but that's, just so you know, again, we're not trying to be uh, difficult with you guys, but if we need, we may need your boots. If we find boot prints in the scene, uh, here's a quick uh, thing where the ambulance was parked at one scene before. The guys went out and they just, all they did was they did that. They stepped down, 
and then one of the general duty members put a cone beside it and he said those sets of footprints, the three sets of footprints there are from the ambulance guys. I took a quick picture, boom. Probably two thirds of the uh, footprints within the scene were accounted for right there. And I'm not chasing my tail around, okay? So. So when I get called, it's because it's possibly a crime scene. Anything you guys get called to, a hanging, a possible suicide, a spousal assault where somebody bleeds out later or the injury takes them later, you got to remember at some point, oops, at some point that might be, or it could be a crime scene right at that time, right? So, uh, and for us, that scene and that body are the most important things. Um, whether it's at the scene or whether it's at the, uh, at the hospital. Uh, the most recent one, uh, we had that stabbing in not too far from here. Um, I spent a good hour and some documenting the body at the scene or at the hospital and, and then trying to f make things fit with at the scene. Not trying to make them fit, but putting the puzzle together, right? So we document her first at the, because that's where she was. And then we went to the scene, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense, document everything. And then I went down for the autopsy. Um, many times myself or my partner Vanessa will on, on these, uh, on the homicide cases or the ones that we haven't proven, like we may hold a scene, we go into a scene, we don't know what it is, it's not, something's not fitting, we will often hold a scene and it may be held for a couple of days until the autopsy comes back and it's like, okay, well, it's natural because of this or it's natural because of that, and then we'll release it. But until that happens, and like I said, typically because we have seen knowledge, we will, we will also go down and document the, uh, the autopsy. Has anybody here ever been to an autopsy, seen one? You have? Yeah. I mean, you've dealt with bodies enough. I mean, it is, uh, I don't want to sound cold. It is kind of cool to see how, how it's done. Um, Again, it's part of the job. I mean, we've been doing it long enough. Some of that stuff is like, wow. And, you know, and then you get to see bullet paths or knife wounds and how they make sense, how the, you know, injuries. Um, at that scene just recently um, in, in Riverdale here, um, a knife was picked up by the ambulance crew, okay? Right away, I kind of like, what, what? What's he doing picking up that knife? And the, the knife was, turned out to be the, the weapon that was used. And at first it was like, you don't touch, and that's part of the reason I'm here today. I mean, n not part of it. I mean, that's, this helps you, this helps us, right? Um, but it made perfect sense after was once he picked up the knife. I mean, it, he could have looked at it right where it was, because I, th I thought where, where it was sitting, it was fine that you could judge how long it was. But it made perfect sense when he picked it up to, to be able to, what kind of treatment, what kind of wound, how deep could that wound be? Well, once you see the knife, I mean, then, then that kind of helps. So it... I give them a little leeway. Always, if you have to pick something up, and I know you guys are wearing, because of personal protection, you're always wearing gloves, double gloves, whatever. You know, you're always wearing something, uh, some sort of protective glasses, whatever you may have to wear. Make sure uh, that that's uh, something that you, you don't even think twice about. You're always wearing that stuff, especially if you have to pick up some, uh, um, something like a, move something out of the way, a gun or uh, a knife or something, okay? Again, that's uh, that scene that you guys are at, and when we get there, that's our starting point, okay? So just be, just be aware of that. When you guys pull up, and I know, again, you're focused on dealing with this, the, the, the patient, but also be aware for your own safety, just kind of make a mental note as you pull up to a scene. You know, you can see footprints there. There's no, there's no uh, tire tracks. There's nothing really that's going to hurt you there. What does it look like it should? If something's out of place, before you rush in, make sure that you're you're safe. And I, again, this is probably something you guys do in your in your training, anyways. But I'm just kind of re reiterating it, just so you know, it's in all our it's in all our jobs, guys. Okay, uh, this is a Watson Lake situation. Now, just past the tree there. You can, um, I don't have a pointer. Right, you can see a little object laying right there. 
That's a gentleman that uh, decided he didn't want to be on the planet anymore, so he shot himself. And when you look at this scene here, what do you see? What, what looks... Let me add a little bit more information. A general duty constable, the coroner, and I believe one EHS person was to that body and back. What would you say? A single trail going in. So I'm called because it's suspicious. If, if it is suspicious and there's, uh, and that's suspect footwear, they're gone, right? And, well, why didn't you walk beside the trail? Well, because we didn't want to get our pants or boots dirty, whatever. I've heard that many times. And it's like, why am I here? You know, like you've just wrecked most of the, uh, the um, possible evidence is there. So just be aware of stuff like that. I mean, you, there's nothing else around. It's a f you know, foot and a half deep of snow. And you see Buddy laying out there. Uh, I don't think you could see the gun until you got beside him because it was beside him. And he'd been there a few days, but just be aware of that kind of thing. Scene approaches is, is, uh, is quite a bit. Again, I know that you're there to protect and save lives, but just kind of be aware of that. So that's the scene, potential hazards, again, to you and, and obviously the victim, so you're going to be doing that. Uh, again, moving stuff touching stuff if you don't have to. If it's off on the side, there's your, uh, we have what's called a path of contamination. Somebody breaks in that door, this, this um, projector's stolen and the computer's stolen. What's my path of contamination going to be? That door to here and then gone. Bad guys aren't going to spend a lot of time at a scene. They want to get in, they want to get out. So if that's what this is, if, if it's a, at a break and enter or something, or if it's a uh, an H file, something goes down. If there's not a big fight in the house, they're in, they're gone, right? Okay. So just be aware of that if you can avoid that path of contamination. In the, in the situation where I showed you that last slide where you saw the footprints, that's the path of contamination. So if you can avoid it, please do so. <coughs> and again, natural entry points. If, it's, if you go in and it's like, oh no, well I know this guy's dead, there's nothing. Try to walk away in a different way than you can. Like go along the outside, like walk around the edge when you leave type thing. Again, that just uh, accounts or removes any extra footwear and stuff that I'm going to have to deal with. Um, it just, it helps us. Again, I, it just, this is all stuff. It may not stick. If it sticks, great. It helps us and it helps you guys, right? Scene uh, up top corner there. Gentleman was uh, kicked to death in town here a number of years ago. Um, you can see the medical apparatus and uh, some of the debris from, from the pads and, and some of the gauze and stuff is laying around that tree area. Um, his hat's down there. Now, I can't remember if he's, if he's deceased right there or if he, anyways, turns into a homicide scene. So, where, what we ended up doing is, and this is where we did a recreation is to help us, is we called the ambulance crew back, that's one of the members right there with his clipboard underneath his arm, and one of our major crimes members laying there in the, uh, to kind of show where the body was. Because then we look for blood stain. Uh, birch trees, uh, which are around there, I think that's birch. I can actually get fingerprints off those. If you touch them, you can get fingerprints off because it's, well, paper, right? It's almost like the bark on them is so smooth, and if I don't get fingerprints, I can, all, I can get marks and then I can swab them for DNA. And that's what I ended up doing there. I didn't get any viable fingerprints, but I took some swabs and stuff from there. Okay, so just be aware that you may be uh, asked to come back to, uh, to help out, to say, hey, this is what I found here, or I may have moved that, or to come back and get your equipment if need be, your, uh, your uh, devices and whatever else you need. This is probably one of the biggest things, guys, right here. So pay attention to this big time. Clothing, and we understand that you have, you know, you got to get to the wound, you got to stop the bleeding, but 
we've had people with bullet wounds where we're the EHS people, so a bullet wound or a stab wound here. Hey, I got a hole there. Stick the uh, scissors in, cut up, cut down, off they go. Don't do that. Okay? If you see an obvious wound port, you know, a hole, you know, a, a, anything that is, <laughs> wasn't there naturally, then don't cut through it if you can. Okay? Cut around it because you're, you're destroying evidence. And when we get it, lots of times we haven't talked to you because we're focused. We, do, we deal with the scene. The major crimes guys may talk to you guys. And then we're trying to, how'd this happen? In this case, Buddy there, um, this is a Sinclair one up on the hill where Buddy was stabbed numerous times and so he's got many holes. But um, that was a white t-shirt, obviously not anymore. And um, again, I'm trying to explain is some of it from EHS trying to remove the clothing to provide medical treatment or is it something caused from the weapon? Okay, so be very aware of that if you can. I understand, again, preserve and protect life. I fully understand that. And if you have to cut through, then you have to. But make a mental note what you saw, okay? Because if, if you cut through it, and I know you don't have time to whip out a camera and all the rest of it to do that. That's not what we're expecting here. But make a mental note because you may be asked. And, you know, you saw a two-inch, you know, two-inch uh, stab, uh, a hole in the shirt right here, and you had to cut through it. Just make sure you're able to tell us that, okay? Always be, uh, always be uh, cognizant of that kind of stuff. This is something that we get called to quite a bit. Young lady here in town many, many years ago. Um, again, decided that life wasn't worth living anymore, and she hung herself. Uh, when you get to um, these kind of scenes, and I know lots of you guys have been to scenes where somebody's hung themselves and the family still thinks that they can be saved, you know, they think it just happened, or in some cases maybe it just did happen. If you can, try not to cut through knots. If you can cut through partway, like if it's a wire or whatever, try not to cut through the knots because the knots are evidence. Knots can be used to tell if the person tied it themselves or if they were suspended by somebody. We have experts that, that uh, in knots. So if you can, and again, this is, you, you might get to one of these scenes and you'll cut right through it. Who knows? But this is just something to be aware of. Be cognizant of this kind of thing. Um, we were called because it was suspicious. The coroner at the time, he was a junior person, hadn't done it, did not think that a person could hang themselves like this because they could have simply just stood up. Right? Guys, if somebody wants to kill themselves, they're going to kill themselves. Okay? Um, it doesn't matter if it's like that. We've been called to uh, extension cord where Buddy's sitting on the floor and the extension cord went over the door and he says, well, how, why is he dead? Well, it's, it's simple. The, the cords st stretch out, right? And uh, next thing you know, they could be hanging himself from a bridge and standing on the ground. I had that happen to me in Vancouver once where I get there and, and I'm talking to one of the uh, other constables there and, well, where's the victim? Because I can see my trainer standing over on the side who I think he's talking to somebody, he's got his notebook out, and I think he's talking to a witness, well, it turns out that was the victim, hung himself from a cord, and, and basically it had stretched to a point where he was on the ground like this. So underneath a bridge, I couldn't tell that he had an extension cord around his neck, and so it's possible for that stuff to happen, so just be aware of that. Try not to cut through knots if you can, okay? Uh, anytime... You come across any, uh, any weapons, like I said earlier about the one we had in Riverdale here not too long ago where they picked up the knife. If you can avoid picking up a, a potential weapon, um, who here has seen uh, knives that have been used as weapons or to hurt themselves with? Quite a few. So you know you're going to see a little bit of that pinkish stuff on there. You're usually going to see grease on there from the fat, you know, depending on what they cut, if they tried their wrists or if they, you know, it's an assault or something. So you, you, it's going to stand out pretty quickly that it's a weapon. So if you can avoid picking it up for any reason, please do so. Because even if you put the gloves on, if you're not careful on how you put your, your latex gloves on, you're going to transfer your DNA onto it, okay? Again, DNA, like I can get DNA from your laces, you tie up your boots, you touch a pen, you write down a quick note, we can get DNA. That's how refined it is now and how, how uh, 
exacting it is. So try not to cross-contaminate when you, when you go to scenes. If you, if you see a weapon, you know it's, okay, whoa, this guy's top of his head's gone. Uh, you're not going to do anything for him, right? You then become a witness, just so you know. There's that, you know, transformation period where it's like, okay, well, I'm not helping him, so. Again, you may end up having to be called into court. You could be subpoenaed. Uh, what did you see when you get there? Um, you may have moved something, whatever. Okay, you cut up the clothing. You saw this two-inch hole. You could potentially be, be called uh, as a witness. So just be aware of that. Um, it took me probably six months from when I went from General Duty Highway Patrol to when I became a forensic identification specialist to write my reports um, a different way. And what I mean by a different way is before, I'm trying to prove mens rea and actus rea, so the, the elements of the offense, reasonable doubt, all the rest of it, right? And you're trying to put a bad guy away. You're telling a story so that, hey, that's your accused or your suspect. You're telling the story so that everything points to him. Now, what I do now is totally different. I speak for the evidence. What it means is, is up for the trier of fact, the judge to determine, right? So when I go to court now, it's very easy for me. I've, I've spent a week on a stand uh, four years ago, five years ago, three times during that one year. Three times I was on the stand for a week. So you can imagine standing there and we always stand in our suits and we stand up, we don't sit down. And, but it's easy. And, and it's easy in the fact that I'm speaking to what's, what you can see. Here's the picture. It's right there. You know, if it's a fingerprint or a footprint, it's what's there. I find it and I match it to, I don't match, and just so you guys know, in, in forensics, when we do fingerprint matches, when I go to court, I don't say that this fingerprint located on this computer belonged to her. I don't match fingerprints to people. I match fingerprints to fingerprint forms. They always have to call the constable in to uh, see that he took the fingerprints from that person. So I've been to court in Haines Junction once three times and for whatever reason, the officer on the last occasion didn't show up, but it worked out because the guy pled guilty anyways. But the continuity was broken in the fact that he testified that he took the, the, the digits that were on a piece of paper. I matched the fingerprints from the scene to that, that uh, piece of paper, the prisoner form, okay? And in, uh, in almost 16 years of doing this job, just so you know, I've never gotten a fingerprint off a doorknob yet. Like they do stuff on, we have that thing called a CSI effect, where they find fingerprints on everything. We're in the north, it's cold, it's dry. Um, fingerprints are, are left from sebaceous oils, from you touching your face, but it's mostly from sweat, okay? Uh, when you look at your fingers, you see all those little lines of friction skin? Well, you sweat to help you grip, and that's the same with your feet, hey? These are called volar surfaces. And if it's dry, like it is right now, and you can feel your hands, if you can do that, and they're, okay, I could pick up a glass and probably not leave fingerprints right now because my hands are dry and whatever. So just so you're aware of that, you know, we, we don't get a lot of fingerprints, it seems. We get a lot of footprints, tire impressions. Um, if I find a really, really good fingerprint at a scene, guess what? It's probably a, a police officer's fingerprint. <laughs> not really. Like, we used to have a thing back in the day where... I'd find a fingerprint, did you, uh, did you touch that? And the officer, no, I didn't. You sure? Were you, oh, I was wearing gloves, okay. You sure, okay. So then we sent it off to Ottawa to get searched. Uh, then we get a message back saying, ah, oh, it belonged to, belonged to that guy. So then next thing you know, a bottle shows up on your desk because he was a bad boy and <laughs> it doesn't happen that way anymore. What happens now is they get a hit to a member. It goes to the head of, in Ottawa, it goes to the head of the, uh, the undercover unit. He says, is this guy working a project for you? No, he's not. Then it goes to our criminal operations officer here, and then that guy gets called in and he has to explain why his fingerprints are on something. Um, if you guys have been checked security-wise, if he touched something, guess what? Same thing's gonna happen. You probably won't get called into our criminal operations officer, but you may be, ex be asked to explain why that fingerprint was, uh, was uh, found on a, on a certain item. So again, it comes down to just being aware of the whole the potential you guys could be going to court to explain something, right? Just be aware of that, eh? Don't be scared of it. Get up there and, you know. Uh, I think somebody, there was a few people here said they testified in court. 
Crown wants you to say what they want you to say. They, they've got a story, they've got their storyline. Defense will come at you and they'll throw some of the wildest stuff at you just to, or they'll keep asking. I had one time, uh, the same question was asked four times. Exact same question. It was actually an Integra tire file and it was um, a member uh, brought, brought in uh, a memory stick and wanted a copy of the video from, the, from Integra Tire put onto, that, uh, onto a DVD. So I basically, okay here, stuck it in, copy on, on your computer, and then I put it on the disc and I give him, here you go, here's your stick, here's your, uh, here's your uh, the DVD, and he left. And I was asked four times. And I, I think what happened was the defense was trying, to, there was trying to say that there was a clip piece of the video that was missing. But by the end of it, I, I was starting to become not professional and the fact that I was, I kind of said, I think the very last time I said, look, I took the stick and I stuck it into the computer and I tried to talk to him like I was talking to a five-year-old, <laughs> which, you know what, I, I felt kind of somewhat bad after, but it just, it, that's what they're going to do. They're going to play games. So just be aware that defense lawyers will try to trick you up. If they're asking you a question, they know the answer already. So if that ever happens, just be aware of that, right? Uh, again, I mentioned it earlier, if you get to a scene and it's cold, you, want, you close a window, you close a door, whatever, when I get to a scene, I document the scene as I find it. So if something comes up in court about, well, no, when, I, when one of the witnesses got there, that that table was over there, and this happens lots where you guys try to get to a victim, you move stuff around, a witness might bring it up and say, when I got there, this was there, and, and well, how come it's not like that, Sergeant? Well, I don't know. Did you, did you talk to witnesses? That's how I found it when I got there. So if you have to move something or move, roll somebody over, whatever, again, if, if you're not explaining it to us so we can explain it to the courts, you might get, get called, okay? So just be aware of that as well. And again, there's a, the whole footprint thing there. Um, we may need them, so if you have to open, do, move, whatever, make note of that, make a note in your report that you had to move a table off the, the victim to get to him to treat him. That's fine, you're doing your job, but just remember you may be asked that, okay? Uh, this is just basic stuff. You're treating somebody, you know, uh, a family member or, you know, a drunken friend or whatever, uh, you know, wants to get in, keep them back, okay? Again, it's just compounding the situation. If you guys are there before the police get there, which is probably typical on, a, on, a, on an injury where, it's, where you guys are called by a family member, hey, I need help, they don't usually call us first, they call you guys first because they want that person to get help right away. So just be aware that uh, you want to keep people away from the body if possible. Um, we recently had a number of issues with uh, baby deaths and family members and it's kind of a really sore spot right now. The, the Yukon Coroners Act is being rewritten and it's going to be done this fall about touching bodies and stuff like that. You know, we're not trying to be cold hearted when it comes to babies and stuff, but um, it happens where, look, now that if we're called, the police, the major crimes are called, the forensic guidance called, we got a problem, it's suspicious, and then family members want to, you know, pick up and touch. Well, when they're doing that, they can create artifacts, they can create injuries that weren't there before. So that's the one thing you got to be aware of. You know, wait for us to get there, and then if we're going to let somebody be hands-on, touch the baby, whatever, then we're going to, uh, we'll let them do that. So it's just, again, it's, it's the old trying to reduce the cross-contamination, okay? These are just simple things, guys. You know, if you have to wait around at a scene, in the immediate scene, never do any of these things. Again, you're, you're potentially leaving. And the only reason I bring this stuff up is some of this stuff here has been done by police officers within scenes, right? Gone potty in the scene, you know, went over and side by a tree and it's like, okay, is this suspect or whatever? And they don't say anything until, you know, three days later when you've worked, spent many hours trying to explain why that's there and they, they were embarrassed, you know. Be reasonable, get outside the scene. Uh, leaving the equipment behind, if you can take it with you, like I said, the, the one in Porter Creek there, there was, I don't know if it was a big defibrillator, was that? Modern defibrillator, yeah. yeah, was that you that was, that came? Uh, no. 
Because the super, big supervisor rig came up and yeah. I just saw the stripes there. I figured maybe. maybe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, okay, that's, you know, if you can take it with you first instance, please do so. Because if you have to come back for it, once that, once that scene's locked down, it's locked down, you're not going to get it back. Okay? Well, not get it back right away. Until we duck, take a couple quick photos of it, make a note where it is, maybe a quick measurement, then we'll release it. That's fine. So, again, this is just simple stuff, guys. If you can, when you're pulling up to a scene, you know, and you see something that looks wrong, try not to drive over, other, you know, go off the uh, beaten path when it comes to uh, uh, tire tracks and stuff like that. Again, I know you're going to be in a hurry, but if, if, you know, if you think about it. Again, yeah, no matter how small your efforts are when you, when you guys are at a scene, you know, it's going to help us greatly. It's going to help us keep, keep, uh, keep our things moving along very steadily instead of having to answer more questions about stuff. Um, you know what, I throw this in just because uh, we all see horrific, horrific things, and I imagine you guys have, uh, you know, the whole PTSD thing, and uh, do you guys, four years ago, the RCMP um, brought in policy, so forensic identity specialists, ER team members, the dog men have to have a, a physical every year, and the reason we do is because we deal with chemicals, doing fingerprints and stuff like that, we deal with blood and all that other stuff, so every year, we have to have a physical, a full physical. And as part of that now, starting four years ago, we also sit down with a psychologist and they have a, a sheet that they ask us questions from just to make sure, as one of my colleagues uh, from Vancouver uh, says that my cheese have, hasn't slipped off my cracker yet. And, uh, and Diane has been to Rwanda, she's been to the tsunami, uh, she's been to all kinds of stuff, and I don't know how her cheese is uh, still firmly affixed to her cracker, but uh, that's something we do. So I imagine, uh, I mean, uh, you guys obviously have something program. You know, your friends, your, your partners, your whatever, if you see something going on that's not quite right, something out of the normal, bring it up to that person or bring it up to the supervisor. Let them know just in case, right? Help each other because the last thing you want is... Uh, to get that call to the buddy's house and, you know, something have gone sideways, right? Or an addiction problem or something like that. That's pretty much my presentation, guys. Um, again, when, when I was asked to come and do this, I, we do many talks. We do them for schools. We do them for ENR. I did one not too long ago for Energy Mines and Resources. We do them for everybody. And again, it's, it's to assist us all doing our job. And... For you guys, A, to be safe and also, you know, potentially, hopefully not uh, destroying evidence if possible, right? Again, I know preserve and protect life, that's the first, first goal, but this kind of gets into our world and if you can be aware of that, it'd be good. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time. Is there any questions? Yes? Um, yeah, it would be, yeah, put it into, you know, I mean, plastic bag, because you don't want to get biologicals all over the place, right, leaking everywhere, so, um, if clearly you can see something in there, it is going to be evidence, so, yeah, a plastic bag is fine for now, like I said, try to avoid any of the wound holes, if you can, again, because that's evidence, uh, and then, yeah, into a bag, and then just turn it over to the first police officer you see. Okay. Anybody else? I just want to say that I found it informative for the simple fact that I had a, a crash on suicide a few years ago. Um, myself and my responding crew member made an arrangement. They cleared the right hole and, and moved it out of the way of the coroner who crashed out of the episode of that one. But I didn't know. I didn't know to ask that question. So I appreciate you coming in and, and explaining it. Easier to learn it in a, in a situation of surroundings and this than to overtake it and come.
Yeah. Well, again, like if you have to move it, you have to move it. I don't have a problem with that. Just wear gloves and put it in such, I mean, if it's a gun, you don't want it to be discharging again. You're not going to unload it. You'll let the police do that because we, uh, the situation I was at last night, we, you know, um, turned out to be a suicide, but um, it's a situation where we're unloading it. Move it off to the side enough that you can do your job and then make a mental note exactly where you found it because that tells us a lot, okay? So just be aware of that and uh, shouldn't be any problems. Okay, again guys, thank you very much.